she went burnt. She burnt. Somebody, somebody probably set the car on fire or something. I don't know. She just come out of the woods at my house. That's the worst one I've seen. I couldn't um, couldn't believe she was still conscious and alert with the amount of burn she had. What did she do that was so awful that she would die a torturous death like this? That's what we want to know. I have nothing to do with nothing. Not my friend. I'm telling you, my friend. I would never hurt her. On March 24, 2010, a man named Terrence sat outside his home in Pensacola, Florida, enjoying the fresh night air. By all accounts, it was a perfect spring night. That is, until a faint voice rang out from the forest surrounding his home. At first, Terrence couldn't make out what the voice was saying, and then it came again, a panicked and pained moan. It was a woman calling out for help. Terrence couldn't have had the slightest idea of the gruesome crime that had just been committed against this woman, a crime so brutal that you may have trouble believing it. In reference to the uh, call, uh-huh. uh, we're on scene the fire saying that the patient, uh, she's got second degree burns over 100% of her body, but uh, she's saying that there was no vehicle involved, that people dragged her out of her house and set her on fire. At first, through the forest shrouded in shadows, Terrence couldn't make out the woman calling for help. Moments later, when he finally could, he was horrified. A 19-year-old woman, Adriana Zimmerman, slowly stumbled toward him out of the darkness. Burns coated every inch of her skin, so severe that he couldn't make out the color of her skin or whether she was wearing any clothes at all. Terrence called 911 while Adriana sought refuge on his porch. 911, what's going on out there? Somebody say somebody's outside. Burn up. Her, this lady on fire right now. She what? She burned all up. You got to see She burnt. She burnt. Like somebody probably set the car on fire or something. I don't know. She just come out of the woods at my house. As they waited for EMS to arrive, Terrence noted that Adriana smelled heavily of gasoline, and there was a severe injury on her head in addition to the burns. Whatever she had endured had left her barely clinging to life. By 9.24 p.m., an EMT arrived at the scene to find Adriana sitting on the porch with her arms outstretched, rocking back and forth to soothe her pain. The extent of her burns meant that the EMT on the scene couldn't offer her much medical assistance. Even for a seasoned EMT, the sight was deeply disturbing. She was kind of moaning. She was just in a sitting position, and the way she was looking was it, it hurt to move anywhere, so she was kind of in whatever position she was the most comfortable. It was in a sitting with her arms stuck straight out. She was, she was moaning, and it was hard to understand her due to her jaw. Her jaw was very deformed and stuck out, uh, so she kept you know, mumbling, help me, help me, and I told her, you know, I'll try to help you. Uh, you just got to stay there and try not to move for me. Um, really, with a burn victim like that, there's nothing much we can do until EMS gets there. And your training experience when you saw her, what was your first thought? That's the worst one I've seen. I couldn't um, couldn't believe she was still conscious and alert with the amount of burns she had. Did you feel her condition was grave? Yes, sir. Just from your experience and seeing uh, what you've seen? Yes, sir. Just from seeing that, plus the head trauma, uh, the amount of head trauma she had to her face, I, I would not have expected her to make it through the night. She kept telling me she was, I'm about to pass out, I'm about to pass out. So I told her to try to stay awake for me, and I wanted to get the info of the suspects before she passed out. Fearing that she would never wake up if she passed out, the EMT dug for all the information that he could about what happened to her. She managed to tell him that she'd been taken from her house, tased, beaten with a crowbar, and then set on fire. En route to the hospital, the paramedic supervisor tended to Adriana's wounds as much as they were able to. In their interview with the police, they disclosed heart-wrenching details of the ride to the hospital. And I told her, keep fighting. And uh, she kept saying over and over again, am I gonna make it, am I gonna make it? And I told her I was gonna try. And she said, "When I just tell me I'm gonna wake up and see my babies. I got to talking to her and I told her that I was probably gonna be the last person she talked to for a while and that we, in order to catch the people that did this to her. I needed her to tell me if she knew who it was. And I asked her why they did it to her, and she said, um, I thought we'd made up. Without being able to give more details about the horror she had endured, Adriana was given morphine for her pain and fell into a coma. Investigators were desperate to find the perpetrators behind such a heinous crime. It wasn't long before they inferred that wading through all the convolution and getting to the heart of the horrific incident was going to be anything but clear-cut. This is Cypress Trail Mobile Home Park, 
where 19-year-old Adriana had only lived for a few months before the horrific incident took place. Adriana moved to Florida with her children from her hometown of Lubbock, Texas. Her family, who lovingly nicknamed her Augie, missed her from the moment she left for the Sunshine State. She was a loving, dedicated mother to her two children, and her final words before she fell into a coma confirmed this. En route to the hospital, barely clinging to life, she repeatedly asked the medical professionals to take care of her children and check on them since they were home alone. Mere hours after Adriana was taken to the hospital, law enforcement arrived at the trailer park. They knocked on Tina Brown's door at lot number three of the trailer park, where she lived with her 16-year-old daughter, Brittany Miller. Then they knocked repeatedly at lot number one, where Heather Lee resided with her husband, Darren Lee. For nearly an hour, no one responded, until finally, after incessant knocking, Heather answered. She, Darren, and Tina had been holed up inside her home the entire time. By then... The police had plenty of questions for them. Throughout the interrogations you're about to see, law enforcement is forced to wade through a sea of contradictions and lies created by suspects who were seemingly racing each other to dry land. That race to escape began the moment Heather Lee was put in a cop car to be brought back to the station for questioning. The following footage has been analyzed by a qualified team, including a licensed professional counselor and a licensed attorney. It's cold in here. All right, we'll tell him. She says she's cold back here. Um, can you tell me what's going on? Huh? Can you tell me what's going on? Just hang tight, okay, dear? Okay. After setting Heather in the car, the police leave her alone for another 20 minutes. She fidgets anxiously in the back seat. What's your full name? Heather. H-E-A-T? H-E-R. You work anywhere? No, sir, not Several witnesses and neighbors interviewed allege that many people in the trailer park sold illegal substances or allegedly worked as escorts, including Tina, Heather, Adriana, and their partners. In the four months leading up to the battery of Adriana, cops had visited the trailer park 25 times, but this time would prove to be the most ghastly, heartbreaking visit of all. What is going on? Okay, well, first of all, we're investigating a, a, a battery here with your, with your neighbor there behind you. Adriana? I guess. The lady lives behind you. Yeah. Listen to me now. Okay. I'm going to ask you some questions. Okay. I didn't see Adriana earlier today. All right. I'm, uh, my name is Investigator Watts. I'm with the Sheriff's Office. Okay. And we were called out here on an ag aggravated, some type of disturbance tonight, okay, okay. where your uh, neighbor was uh, critically injured and you have been implicated, maybe having some knowledge or information or, or even being involved. Okay. I have to ask you some questions, but before I ask you any questions, I'm going to have to write, advise you your rights, okay? The detective reads Heather her Miranda rights. She accepts them rather calmly, but her calmness and patience will start to wane as the police begin to really question her. First of all, tell me, did you, did, do you know the situation we're, we're talking about here? No, sir. That's why I keep asking what's going on. Okay. Where, where have you been all afternoon? What have you been doing? I've been here at the house. I was cooking. I see Adriana earlier today. Who? Adriana. My neighbor, she was down this way by my aunt's house talking with us earlier. And then I had one back in the house. I cooked and I laid down after that. Okay, who's, is anybody in the house with you? Nobody but my husband. He was in that suite. That's your husband? That bed, yeah. Y'all, it's just two of y'all live there? Yeah. My kids are with my mom. Okay, this girl was taken from her house and beaten up. Okay. Okay, I seen her earlier today. She told me that she had a date. That's all she told me. And I asked her who it was. She was riding the bike up and down Detroit. And I asked her when she went that way, I said, where do you keep going when you go that way? She kept saying Fowler. But she would never tell me where on Fowler. And then she said, girl, I got a hot date tonight. It's interesting that Heather immediately provides information to deflect the interest away from herself and toward the supposed hot date. Do you know the lady lives in lot three back there? Tina, yes, I know Tina. All of us know each other out here. I met her when she first moved out. Okay, how long has she been here? Um, I'm not quite sure. It's been a couple months, though. 
she ain't been living out here no longer than a year. Okay, where did you where did you go tonight before we got here? The night before the night. Tonight? Yeah. I didn't go anyway. So you've been in this you've been in your house. I've been here the and down time. by Tina house and by my aunt house and back here. I was here cooking. My other aunt, my mom's sister came around here, her and the kids. And I was in there cooking fish and fried. And it's still on the stove. Heather telling the officer that the fish is still on the stove is an attempt to prove that she's being truthful. In reality, her desperation to provide evidence of her activities only makes her look more suspicious. People who are innocent often don't feel such a stark need to back their story up. In just a moment, you'll see her try to validate her whereabouts even more by listing people who can provide her with an alibi. Take note of just how many times she does this. I won't sit here and believe what you're saying, but we're getting information. You know what's going on here. You you was, you was, and Tina. I don't know anything about what's going on here. Like I said, I was here at the house. My mom called me on my cell phone. I talked to my mom. My aunt came here, heard the kids. My two cousins was in the car with them. My aunt down in the fourth trailer, she seen me today. My Uncle Charles so seen you, me today. So you're sitting here and telling me that you and Tina... Y'all didn't have a problem with this girl back there? Had I didn't have no problem with uh, Audriana. I've been ha hanging out with Audriana every day. All of us been hanging out together. You and you and Tina didn't jump on her? No, I didn't do nothing to Audriana. I would not harm a hair on her head. Heather's protesting that she couldn't have been involved because she would never hurt any part of Audriana is known as a convincing statement. This type of statement is often a sign of deception as a truthful person's first instinct would likely be to outright deny an allegation, rather than try to convince the person posing the question of something. I had to protect her once before. From who? Because her and some girls was getting into it, and I stopped them from jumping on them. Other than that, I haven't had any problems with her. Her kids, <laughs> I always have her kids with me. Me and Audrey is just like that. Ever since she moved out here, we became friends. Okay. Here, Heather's palm seems to be facing up as she's speaking. The palm-up position is not very affirmative, and it suggests that the speaker is asking or pleading to be believed. This may indicate that she's feeling uncertain about the statement she just made. And the kids, I love the kids. And they went with me to get my hair done and everything. I seen her this morning, and then I seen her about two and about three. Where'd you see her at? I seen her down this way by my aunt's house. She and was you, right you down, were down there. Yes, yeah, she was right down there. That's way. when you when you were down there when you saw her. Yeah, you know, those three. She came over to the So car. you're saying you saw her three different times today? Yes, I seen her. And today. she was down there. She was down there. All she three was talking times. to me. Is that all you all you know about this? Yes, sir. Okay. And I put that on everything. And I you love. you swear that this <laughs> statement you gave me is the truth, the best yes, you're not. Yes, sir. Adrian is my friend. You doing you got anything? No, sir. The police conclude their interview, but what Heather requests next is very telling and makes her look even more suspicious. I want to see her. See her? How you read them? Well, that's not going to be possible right now. You got where you found her? Would you tell me if you knew what happened? Yes, sir, I would. That's my friend. Okay. All right, we'll be back with you in just a second, okay? okay? Once more, Heather is left in the car. She shifts uncomfortably and sniffles, wiping her tears until it seems she cannot take the anxiety brewing inside of her any longer. While to some her next actions may seem to be those of a desperate friend, to others they likely appear to be those of a suspect trying to feign concern. Baby! Get the, uh, I wanted to know what's going on. Huh? I wanted to know what's going on. Didn't the investigators tell you already? Yeah, I, they told me that, but... Okay, well, I, I can't tell you any more than what they told you, sweetheart. All right, they didn't tell me I was under arrest. Or, no, you're not but, under arrest. Okay, now, okay. how can I find out where can I go see her at? You just got to wait, okay? And then when they all get done, I can find out? Yes, ma'am. Okay. All right. Okay. You have some people come in here. He won't talk to you. Okay. Meet Darren Lee, Heather's husband. He's no stranger to run-ins with law enforcement, having been convicted of two prior felonies in 2001. 
including battery and sale of a controlled substance. As soon as he's put in the car, it seems that the couple begins retracing their steps in a discreet way to ensure her and Darren's stories are aligned once they're separated for questioning. This early in the investigation, we can only speculate as to the reason behind Heather and Darren having been placed in the vehicle together. It's possible that law enforcement just needs to secure them for the time being. However, it's also a possibility that officers are intent on capturing what the two might inadvertently disclose as the camera is running. I told her that I was just in a sleep. Four forty eight, copy code. I told him that was what's up. You just like the movie. And I was right there on the couch. The blocking ground came by. I ain't got no problem with going. Like I told him, I seen Adriana earlier today. They talk about the gas can and everything else. What gas can? Gas can from the uh, on the floor. The gas? Them gas cans being on the porch. I don't even know who gas cans are there. I don't know who gas. I don't know who gas cans are there. Heather's reaction to Darren mentioning the police taking gas cans off their porch is rather frantic and over the top. Them gas cans being on the porch. I don't even know who gas cans are there. Especially considering the fact that at this time. Officers had not even disclosed that Adriana was burned. I ain't know what the hell was going on. They told me I I just seen her today. And now they saying she in tense care. I seen her before it got dark. All right, man. She asked me for a day right. today. I'm going to give you about a minute more. Say your things and we, we fix it and go. Um, I need to talk to you real quick. All right? I'll give you about a minute more. Say goodbye. Hey, am I on arrest? You are not free to go at this time, so you can consider it whatever you want to consider it. You're not free to go right now. Okay. All right? Okay. Okay. I think I can hold you 48 hours or something. I don't know. You are... 48 hours? I think you're detained at this time. How about that? So yeah, we get a chance to talk to you. Okay? They just want to talk to you. Oh. The two are being detained as the officer has reasonable suspicion that there is criminal activity afoot or evidence of criminal activity to be found through the temporary detention and questioning of the individuals. A detention is different than an arrest, which requires that the officer has probable cause to believe a crime has in fact been committed, was in the process of commission, or was about to be committed. The standard for probable cause is higher than that of reasonable suspicion. Reasonable suspicion must be based on specific and articulable facts, combined with rational inferences from those facts, and the suspicion must be associated with a specific individual or individuals being detained. You get my phone and call Jean. The Jean that Heather is referring to is an attorney who she will be asking for rather frantically soon. After this, Heather, Tina, and Darren were brought to the station for further questioning. However, there was still one person missing whom cops desperately wanted to speak with, 16-year-old Brittany Miller, Tina's daughter. Tina told police that earlier, Brittany had left for the hospital with her friends, Jessica and Mallory, in Tina's maroon SUV. Brittany had hurt her hand, though Tina told investigators that she didn't know how. Investigators searched the area for Brittany and the SUV, but their initial searches proved fruitless. Brittany's name, car make, and model, and her physical description were broadcast to all patrol units in a desperate attempt to find her. 
Without Brittany in custody, back at the station, the thorough questioning of Tina, Heather, and Darren began. On top of their stories contrasting with one another, even their demeanors in the interrogation rooms were wildly different. You have Heather, who is clearly distressed. Officer! Yes, ma'am. He's giving me a nurse or something. For what? I don't feel good. I wouldn't be feeling good either right now. I'm having an anxiety attack. I have anxiety attacks. Well, I've already called. They're supposed to be coming back to you, OK? okay? That's all I can do right this moment. OK. Sit up there in that chair up there and set your head down on that desk. And just breathe right. Okay? Okay. Please let him be alright. Please let him be alright. Please let him be alright. Heather's anxiety is tangible in the 30 minutes she's left alone in the interrogation room. And as you'll see shortly when her interrogation continues, she has every reason to be anxious. Her husband, on the other hand, didn't seem entirely concerned when he was interrogated, even casually chatting with someone on the phone beforehand. <laughs> You ready, man? Four, seven, seven. Yeah. I'm for real. I'm gonna call you right back, man. And then there's Tina, sitting emotionless in the interrogation room while she waits for police to enter and question her. Did you grab a form? Okay. Oh. How you doing? I'm Investigator Lee Tyree, and this is Investigator Tom Watts. After this, the police remind everyone of their rights now that they are officially in the interrogation rooms. An important thing to note is that Tina was the first to be interrogated, followed by Heather. Take a look at how their stories compare. Even their initial retellings of why they didn't answer the door don't align. I've been talking to you for a few minutes. I was kind of trying to find out why you weren't answering the door when we came to your house this evening. You explained that you saw the cops and that yeah. you were nervous about that. Is that true? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. We were just watching movies. Okay, so you, Darren, and Tina were sitting in the living Heather. room. Heather. Heather were sitting there in the in the living room watching movies. Mm -hmm. And when the cops knocked on the door, what would y'all do? We were sitting there. Okay. Why didn't you answer the door? It ain't my door. Okay. Did they do anything special when the cops knocked on the door? Turn out the lights, turn the off lights TV. were already off because we were being nosy looking out the window seeing what's going on next door. Okay, so you saw the cops next door first? Mm -hmm. Were the lights on before the cops came over next door? Yeah. And then y'all turned them off when they came over next yeah, door? Yeah, you can see better with the lights off. You don't okay. see nobody looking back at you. Tina having, Tina having been at my house all night. Okay, so you sitting there in the in the living room watching movies. Mm -hmm. Tina hasn't been at your house. And she haven't been at my house all night. Where was she at? She came in. She came and knocked on the door, and I got up. She said the police was out there. Okay. And I just laid there. Did she, got, you at? Did she come? I was in? on the couch. I did just she? laid there because I was asleep. Did she ever come in the house after she told you the police was there? She came in the house, and she sat down. In your house? Yeah, she sat on my couch. And what, what did she And I asked her what was going on, and she told me she didn't know. I'm confused here, because Darren told me that y'all 
you and Tina were there and cooking all night. Tina was there when I was cooking earlier. Okay. But she wasn't out there all night. Where'd she go? She had left. She told me she was going home. Okay. About what time was that? It was what time I was cooking. It was getting dark when I was cooking. And I stopped cooking about six or seven. So she, Tina left around six or seven? Yeah, she left. Okay. And when did she come back over to your house? She came back probably like 30 minutes to an hour later. So she was gone for 30 minutes to an hour. Yeah. And she comes back and the cops show up right at the same she, time? She came in and she said the cops outside. Did you see the cops outside that time? I looked. I got up and I looked and I seen the lights. You can see the spotlights. I see the spotlights. And where are they at? They was outside. Are they outside they of was out Indiana by, They was outside or? of Tina house. They were outside of Tina's yes, house. They was outside of Tina's house. Were they outside of Adriana's house at all or no? When I had came out, they was outside of Adriana's house. Okay. That's when, when they knocked on the that's door when and you I answered came. the door. Yeah, when I and answered. You didn't the door. answer the door for like an hour. I didn't they didn't knock on my door. Oh yeah, they beat on that door. Not on lot one they did because I was laying right there on the couch and I didn't hear no locks. Even your husband said they beat on the door and you weren't going to answer the door. And then Tina said they I beat got on up. the door and y'all didn't answer I the got door. Up. It seems Heather is facing what is known as the prisoner's dilemma. This occurs when two or more individuals who are involved in a crime are isolated from one another and urged to confess to the crime. Each is concerned only with receiving the shortest possible prison sentence and each must decide whether to confess without knowing what decision the other or others will make. And Tina said, hold on, don't answer the door. And I asked her why. Okay. We're getting a big diversity in this story. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you like it is. Adriana is my friend. I would never hurt her. Tina came to my house and she told me not to answer my door. I asked her why. She said, cause the cops is out there. Heather's emphasis points are extremely off here when she states she's my friend, then hits the table, followed by I would never hurt her, and strikes the table again. You can actually see and hear how her nonverbal emphasis does not naturally line up with her words as it should. This is widely recognized as an indicator of deception. And then she asked me, she said, where are the cops at? I said, they down there by your house. Why you keep asking me where the cops at? Mm -hmm. And she went and never said she started was she back. She started back. She was acting nervous. She started back puffing on the cigarette. Did she look like she was been running, or did she look like she'd been in a fight? She was acting normal. Notice that Heather's palm is up here, which may be an indication once again that she's unsure of the story she's telling and asking to be believed. Let me ask you a question. She was acting normal. You said you. When we asked and I asked, I said, I said, I said, Tina, I said, you seen Adriana tonight? She said, no, I haven't seen it tonight. And she didn't, she didn't tell you why, why she, she didn't want you to answer the door. She didn't say anything about why she not did, to answer the door. But she did tell you not to answer the door. Yeah. And I told her, I said, I, I said, I don't have anything to hide. I'm going to open my door. And then I got up and I said, who is it? And they said, the sheriff's department, and I opened the door. What was Darren doing? He was laying at the bottom of the couch watching TV. <clears throat> and you're absolutely sure of this? Yes, sir. I am sure. Because this story is a lot different than Tina's story. I am sure. As the investigator has pointed out, Heather's story is wildly different from her husband's. Okay, so you were sleeping until about 7, so you don't know anything prior to that? No. Okay. And, um... Your wife tells me this story about um, Tina coming in, saying the cops are outside, and that um, y'all look out and you see the cops surrounding uh, Miss Zimmerman's trailer, and she says for y'all not to answer the door. Now, I don't recall any of that conversation going on in yours. Now, I do remember you saying y'all didn't answer the door because it was police. Tell me about that. I don't want to say the police was out there. Okay, so you, you don't recall Tina there. coming in and saying the police are outside? Tina was already in the house. Because your wife tells us that you and her are at home alone. Tina comes barreling in and saying, hey, the cops are outside. And y'all see the cops outside. And Tina's saying, don't answer the door. No, nah, that's a lie. That's a lie. Yeah. Okay. Because that's what Heather told us, your I'll, wife. I'll tell you that's a lie. Okay. Why would she lie to us? Do you know? 
No. I mean, she was distraught. She was crying. She was telling us this story. She seemed, <laughs> she seemed like emotional. You know, well, emotional, but she also seemed some sincere. Yeah. It's possible that Heather is lying in order to make Tina look bad and compromise her alibi. Though clearly, she and Darren aren't on the same page about that plan. Obviously, know something's up. Yeah. So tell me what happened tonight. Nothing happened that I know of. Notice how Tina is rubbing her neck, which is a major red flag. It's obvious that she's feeling very insecure and apprehensive. Neck massaging in general is a calming response. In addition, rubbing the vagus nerve near the side of the neck, close to where a pulse is taken, actually results in the release of acetylcholine, which sends signals to the heart to slow down a person's heart rate. However, this isn't to say she's guilty as she's clearly in a stressful situation. But it's also an important tell to take note of. See your arms and hands if I could. Okay, can I see the top, top signs? Mm -hmm. Okay. Those old scars on there? Yeah, I have a puppy. Okay, and what's this right here? That little scratch there. This? Yeah. I, I have a puppy. Okay, and your puppy caused that? Look, I'm going to move here. Got your chin? Okay. Nothing new. All right. No, so where were you tonight? At Heather's. At Heather's house? Well, I was at home. My, my daughter's braiding my hair, so I was at home, but um, it started hurting, and her little friend started coming by. Remember what Tina has said here about her daughter braiding her hair. It will prove to be quite important as the investigation continues. So um, Heather said she was going to cook, so I went down there, and she was cooking uh, fish and french fries, and then we just started watching movies. Okay. And um, did you go anywhere from there? Mm -mm. You were there all night until the cops came up there? Mm -hmm. Tina has put her hand to her mouth here. Whether conscious or not, many individuals will attempt to hide their lie by physically covering the source of their deception. What time did you go over there? Um, probably just started getting dark. Okay, so about, about sunset, you go over the Heathers. Mm -hmm. Was anybody over at Heathers' house when you went over there? Just Heather and her husband. Do you know what happened to Adriana tonight? No, I don't. Heather just said she got beat up, but that's all I know. A little bit more than that. And what was Darren doing while y'all over there cooking? Anything? Laying on the couch watching movies. Okay. All right, but you were home all night. You didn't see any kind of disturbance going on over there before the cops came over there or anything? No, we would have heard something. You said you saw Adriana earlier today? Mm -hmm. What time was that? Um, Adriana was coming and going. Coming and going on a bicycle. Okay. Do you remember the last time you saw her? Mm. Was it while you were still over at uh, Heather and Darren's? I didn't come back out when I went to their house. We, was, we were cooking then. Okay. So it had to have been before sunset. Mm -hmm. So you saw her during the day. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, at once you went over to Heather and Darren's, y'all, you never left there? No. You didn't go to go get anything or go anywhere at all? I don't think so. Notice that Tina's been asked several times if she went anywhere that night, not even 12 hours prior to this interrogation taking place. You seem kind of lackadaisical about this. We're going to go out there. We know what happened out there. It's just going to be a matter of getting fingerprints and evidence back, okay? Out where? It happened at her house? Uh, we didn't no, hear... it didn't. It originated, started at her house. Right. And then it, it, went, it went somewhere else. What started at her house? That's a, this, the, the reason we're here. Well, we got some issues, okay? Mm -hmm. And we're going to get to the bottom of it one way or another, okay? okay. Mm -hmm. So you know, we're sitting here talking to you, and I, I'd certainly appreciate, and I know Tom appreciates that you're talking to us. But we got to get to the bottom of this, and we got to know what happened, the truth. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's two, pe there's two choices here. Either you're going to tell us, or Heather's going to tell us. So, who's going to be? Tina is continuing to show signs of high anxiety, evidenced by her face, neck, and chin rubbing. It's unfortunate that the officer is throwing out questions at such a rapid pace that Tina isn't getting a chance to answer most of them. I didn't do anything to her. Okay. Well, I was to and you were home all night. I was at Heather's house. Okay. You were at Heather's all night. Never left there. 
Because, see, the story between Heather and Darren is already shaky. And your story is a third version of what they've told us so far. Okay? Mm. Now, there's pieces and parts that are the same, but they aren't exactly the same. Okay? Okay? It concerns me. It sounds a little too good, and then the parts that are breaking up, I don't understand why they're not saying the same thing. Okay? Mm -hmm. And so... We need to get to the bottom of this, and somebody's life may end over this. Uh, we're getting we're getting told that she's in pretty critical condition at this point, and not likely to make it. So that's why we're here. Do you understand what he's saying? Not likely to make it. Yeah, she's about what? to die. Yeah. yeah. Okay. That changed gears. <laughs> when she dies, it's going to change gears. Okay. I didn't do anything to her. Okay. I don't want you to tell me anything other than the truth. Okay. I didn't do it. Okay. Still got a problem. <sighs> got anything? If you know anything and you're withholding it, you want to be the first one on board. Okay? You see what I'm talking about? Because <clears throat> once we, take this once we get everybody, to, you know, get every, all the information, yes, there's not going to be second chances. Mm-hmm. And like I said, if, if, if she if she doesn't make it, you're trying to be sleeping with a lot of girls, well, a lot of guys around that. there. I realize that. <laughs> what like, could have did? But, it. I didn't do it. I promised to go. <laughs> While Tina maintains that she had nothing to do with the attack, Heather takes a much different approach. Their behaviors are as different as their stories are and they only grow more dramatic as the interrogations continue. Oh, I hate it. Go grab one across the hall. Sugar, you all right? You don't worry about Arthur. Yeah, I do. Okay. Very worried about Arthur. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I know. My friend. Tell us what happened. I don't know. I don't know. I seen her earlier today. It seems like everything was all right when I seen it today. Let me tell you a little bit what's going on, okay? We did get a chance to talk to Adriana before she went to the hospital. She told us a few things. She told us who did this to her. She told us where, where they took her and what they did to her. Okay? Why do you think I'm talking to you? No, I would never hurt her. I always have pretend to her when she got into it. Okay. People, that's there's, really there's some Heather's statement here left investigators wondering about what kind of things everyone in the trailer park were getting into with each other and what motive it may have provided for brutally attacking Adriana. I she's would friend, never. She's also, your friend told us you did this to I her. would never. We need to go over what you did tonight, okay? Yes, sir. We just talked to your other son. Yes, Tina sir. Brown. Is that your friend, too? Yes, all of the yes. trailer park. And how about her daughter, Brittany? Brittany. Where were y'all tonight? I was at home. When y'all came, when they came to the house, I was right there in the okay. same spot. I, I, they I, on their couch I, I going absolutely to sleep. believe you were at home when we came over there. Where were you maybe half an hour, 45 minutes for that? I was at home. Okay. I was at home. My aunt came by my house. I was in the house cooking. You know what time your aunt came by? Movies. It was almost dark. It was almost dark. Okay, well, we came over to your house and started knocking on your door about 10 o'clock at night. Almost dark and 10 o'clock at night is a big difference. There's, there's about four hours missing in there, okay? A good three. A good three. Uh, the lady in trailer four, that's my aunt. She seen me. Uh, Jerry and... Uh, Heather, uh, a lot of old people see me at me. home. Listen to me. You see me about so dark time. and ten o'clock. There's a lot of hours in there. I okay? was right there on that couch. Okay, so that's where you're saying you're yeah. right on that couch. Ramp and block came to my house. They were laying down okay. watching TV with us. Okay. Anybody else come by your house? My aunt. My cousin Chris, my cousin Kizzy, mm -hmm. the little baby Junior came by. Graham came by, Block came by, and all Jared, went, Jared was at my house. Listen to me. And what time did they get by and what time did they leave? It was dark when Jared came by. There. He always come down there and asked me for cigarettes. What's I went Jerry's to, first and last name? His name is Jerry Johnson. That's my uncle. 
and my aunt name is Terry Smith. Uh, we huh? talked to them at the scene, I believe, yeah. didn't we? They stayed down in Trump's floor. I think we got to see this from there and down the end. Uh, my <laughs> recollection was they didn't see her this evening. It was it was about two and three. They do I was saying it's I, I don't care about two or three in the afternoon. Okay, I care about the night. That's the only time I see Audrey. Okay. I haven't two, seen her since then. Two or three in the afternoon doesn't matter. What time did your aunt and Terry Smith come by? Terry was at home. Her son came down. I asked him to go over to the store to get me some fish fry. Okay, that's, that's before you start cooking. That's before dark. Yeah. After dark, after you cooked, after dark, who comes by? And Jerry was the only one came down. He came Jerry's, down for a series. Jerry yes. Johnson. Yes, he came down. And you down remember about what time that was? I'm not sure what time it was. But he came for a cigarette. And it was dark. He, yes, he asked me for a cigarette. I gave him a cigarette. Okay. I've been at the house all the time, and I've been trying to find out where she was at. Everybody telling me they didn't know where she was at. Heather, why would you be wondering where she's at? Because she always hang out with me every night. We always hang out every well, night. Well, and I feed her told kids us, and everything. The last thing she told us was you... Came in there along with your friends. Yeah. Dragged her out of the house. I put down everything and, I love. I put down my children. Like burn her. Yes. And that's the oh last thing she God. told. Burn her. Yes. See, I ain't know nothing about I know. being burned. So tell me, I what went on tonight? I didn't see her tonight. I see her earlier than I been at my house. It seems fair to say that detectives aren't buying her story. This only becomes more clear as additional horrible facts and evidence come to light. But she was the only friend I was closest to. Now, Heather, you, you know, this is all, when he talked to you earlier and all that, you wasn't upset like this. Why are you upset now? I was crying because I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that she Did was you watch intense all that video? The lady told me she was intense with care and everything. There's this video of you in that car talking to your husband, you ain't talking like this. He was asking me, did I see her today? I told him I seen her earlier today. Well, you know, we watched the video, too, and we saw how you answered this question. I don't care. I didn't have anything to do with this. Yeah. I'm upset because this is my friend. We talking about this is my friend. You said that's going to die. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is my friend. You say you're going to die. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I'm all sick because you're telling me my friends are going to die. I'm here protecting. I'm here protecting. I'm here talking to her mom with her. Now she get into it with them. Who you got to protect her from? Because she been getting into it with Tina and everybody. Okay, so what's her and Tina got to beef over? <laughs> Tina said they get along fine. <laughs> Me and Audrey be just like that. What's, what's wrong with <laughs> Tina's the one hanging out at your house tonight, right? Yes, all okay. of us is friends, but she wanted me to go out of town with her to be a mom. And I promised her I was going to go with her. I promised her I was going to go with her to see her mom. I was trying to help her get some money to get home to her mom. Cause she didn't have anybody here in Pensacola. At the time Adriana was attacked, she was trying to leave Florida and return home to her mother, where she could get a fresh start at a healthy life. It's tragic that that opportunity was taken away from her. Whether Heather was actually trying to help her is uncertain. But there's no doubt Heather's hoping presenting herself like a savior to Adriana will make her look less guilty. I, when I asked you about Adriana and her date, Yes. You said he was supposed to come pick her up, what she told yes. you. Yes. And then you said you were sitting at your house and you saw a set of headlights see, come down You could see headlights coming but in. You didn't, but you didn't pay no attention to it. No. So I don't know if now, he picked her up a, or what. Okay. But Tina, I seen Tina, it. Let's get yes. back to Tina. Okay. Was she at your house at that time? When the headlights yeah. came in? No, she was not at my house. Okay. She was not and in my house. Did I'm you ever see? No, we're not asking you to lie, but what did 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 you see those headlights leave? I seen them came in, they went down, and then the headlights came back up. Came back. How long did they stay down there? They had went down and was down for like ten minutes. 
and then they came back up. So you didn't. You didn't. I, 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 I can lay right there on my couch by the door, and I can see headlights coming in. You still what kind of car it went to? No, I didn't. I didn't never look at the so one. So you didn't I just get up and see, see where the car went. I didn't never I, get okay. up see where it went, but I can see the headlights coming in, in through my front window, and I can see the headlights coming back out through my window on the side where Adrian the trailer is. <laughs> Okay. What kind of car does Brittany have? Brittany don't have a car. Okay. Was she riding around in a car tonight? Did you see her in a car? Was she riding with her friends? Uh, I didn't see her tonight. Soon after Heather was interrogated, the police returned to question Tina Moore. With Heather's testimony, they have some new ways to confront Tina. The stories are a changing. It's interesting that Tina is sitting with her arms in her shirt which isn't something we typically see with adults. We do know, however, that a fight-or-flight response can cause extremities to feel extremely cold. So, you had time to think about it. Mm-hmm. Where were you tonight? Perhaps at home and at Heather's house. Okay. When did you go over to Heather's house? Like, um, when it started getting dark. When it started getting it dark? about sunset. And you stayed over there the rest of the night till the cops got there? Yes. Really? Yes. Because I ain't the story I'm getting. Okay. You don't care, huh? I didn't go anywhere. Heather's saying you're gone for half an hour to an hour tonight. I was not gone for no After half dinner. an hour to an hour. And you come back right before the cops are over there. Cops are over there around 10 o'clock. So from 9 to 10, I got you unaccounted for. So why is it that Heather's saying that your daughter didn't come by her house, that she went by your house? Who went by my house? Your daughter. My daughter was at my house, supposedly. Okay. And she came to Heather's she made, house. We asked her if Brittany came by her house at all today, and she said no. She said the only time she saw Brittany right after school at your house, and that's the only time she saw her today. Well, maybe she didn't see her. I saw Brittany. When they... Asked who was at the door. Brittany said, it's me, Mama. I opened the door. I went outside. Trust me, she's cooperating with this as far as when we ask her stuff. Mm -hmm. And we asked her specifically, was Brittany at your house today? At my house? At her house. I'm talking to Heather at this point. And Heather's saying no. She was and never I asked, inside I of asked Heather of if, house. I asked Heather if you were over at her house, and she said yes. She came over around dinner time, mm-hmm. and then she said you left for half an hour to an hour, <laughs> and that when you come back, hand, when you scared, come I back, promise. you come in in a hurry, nervous, saying the cops are outside, don't answer the door. <laughs> Why is Heather telling me this? You tell me. If me and Heather were together doing this, then how is Heather going to be already in the house and I'm not in the house? Don't know. It seems the detectives are trying to turn Tina against Heather by making Tina think they believe Heather may be innocent. This only stokes Tina's frustration more, as you're about to see. The problem I got is that the story between you and Heather keeps getting further and further apart. I have not changed nothing on mine. Not nothing. Okay. Nothing at all. That's the truth. If that's the truth, then that's the truth, okay? Okay. Nothing's changed from what I've told you. Now, you have it? Nothing at all. The divide between Tina and Heather was growing. Investigators had enough contradictions between the suspect's stories that the alarm bells were now deafening. When they finally got word that Brittany's car had been located behind the house early in the morning, they brought Brittany in for questioning. Tina hadn't seen her daughter since she left for the hospital. Her panic when she thinks she sees Brittany in the hallway at the station before Brittany's first interview is evident. Is that my daughter? Come on. No, that's the girl you, other girl that was with you. That's my daughter's That is not your daughter. You need to step back in here. Brittany. It's not Brittany. Jesus. Have a seat. That's my baby, y'all. They're doing that too. She didn't do nothing. (laughs) Ooh. He probably tell her all kind of lies. <laughs> is she afraid her daughter is about to reveal some incriminating information to detectives? Here in the state of Florida, when a minor is taken into custody, efforts must be made to contact a parent or guardian. 
but generally speaking, an interrogation can take place, and this is likely not going to be favorable for Tina or her daughter. According to 16-year-old Brittany, she hung out with her friends Jessica and Mallory after school until late into the night, at which point they left for the hospital. Her story of why the trip was necessary and why her right hand was now in a cast is interesting to say the least. When police ask her to sign a paper indicating that she's been read her rights, she struggles to sign because of her broken pinky finger, bringing even more attention to the mysterious injury. Okay, I have to sign with my left hand. Okay. What did you do to get out of hand? I broke my pinky. It's really sloppy. Yeah, just do the best you can. Why is it that you think you may be here? I know we talked to your mom last night. Did she tell you? No. What have you been told? That they think that we did something with our next door neighbor. To who? Adriana. Adriana? What is it that you think happened? Have you been told at all? That I don't know. We used to hang out real good. We used to be real close. And then we just stopped hanging out like that. Just stopped? Mm -hmm. Did y'all have any beefs or anything like that? Mm -hmm. When was the last time you talked to her? Yesterday. Around 3 or 4 o'clock, probably. She was riding a bike. And I just asked her where was she going with the bike. She said she was just going to ride. Short conversation? Yeah, it was, it was short. That was it. Brittany explains that she said hi to Adriana when she met her friend Mallory outside Brittany's home before the girls entered. I went in the house and I started braiding my mom's hair. And then that's when my other friend came over and lived next door to me. And she started saying I was hurting her head and stuff. So we stopped. And then she left to go down to Heather House. And me and my other friends, we just stayed there. Just listening to music, danced, watching movies. Who was at the house with you dancing and watching movies? Mallory and Jessica. Mallory and Jessica. Is that it? Yep. Brittany explains that Jessica lives next door. The activities began around 5 o'clock that evening, she claims, and they continued into the night. About what time did everybody leave? They stayed the night. Um, Mallory stayed the night, but Jessica, she went home. She went home about um, 6 o'clock in the morning because we was at the hospital. Because your hand? Yeah. Tell tell me how that happened. Mallory, I was cleaning. We were in my room cleaning up my room, and I asked Mallory to toss me my key. <clears throat> and when she went to toss it, I went like that to try to catch him, and that's when I hit like the corner of the door right there. And that's how I broke it. In your bedroom. Mhm. Mm About what time did that happen? Around one o'clock, one one thirty, and that's when we left to go to the emergency room. About one or one thirty. Mhm. Mm <clears throat> And I went, and I saw went to her house, and I told my mom, I messed up my arm. And she told me to just go ahead and drive myself to the hospital. So you took yourself up there? Yes. Brittany claims that Jessica and Mallory went to the hospital with her. And you talked to your mom about hurting your hand before you left? Mm -hmm. I told her about, I went down, the, when I heard it, I went down to Heather House to where she was at, and I showed it to her. And I told her I heard it, and she said, just go ahead and go to the hospital. And that's when we left. So from about, so the, the only times I'm really missing is from about 6 to 1. Y'all dance and watch movies from 6 p.m. to 1 mm -hmm. until you hurt your hand? Yep. Did y'all ever go outside the house? Mm -mm. Nobody saw y'all outside your house? Nope. Did you ever walk down the road to any of the trailers? Nope. What time did your mom wind up coming home? Um... I don't know, actually, because I was asleep once I came back from the hospital. I went to her room and I went to sleep. And then that's when I got woken up by the police. And it's important that you really concentrate on what you're telling us because mm -hmm. it is on tape. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, because your times are, are, are not adding up. Okay. Because you weren't there at your house between 6 and 1. We know that for a fact. We were out there all night. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, this ain't something we we need to even ask anybody else. Mm -hmm. And if you, it's important you tell us the truth about that or something that minor, if you want to fib about that. You understand what we're saying? Mm -hmm. But that's why I've been at the hospital. 
Yeah. We know you went to West Florida Hospital. Mm-hmm. But you didn't stay. Yeah. They were taking too long, so we went to the other one. That's where just and not you stayed there. You went immediately to the other one? Mm-hmm. We know that's not true. Well, that's where I went, so... I mean, you weren't home. Then I was at the hospital. No, you were at the hospital at 1 o'clock. You just mm-hmm. said. Mm-hmm. I was Florida. Where was you be- Where was you before that? Um, you know what time we picked your mother up? Like at 10 o'clock, maybe 11 o'clock. Okay. So we were at your trailer. Your mother went inside. We got the title to the car. Mm-hmm. You weren't there. The truck wasn't here. And then I must have already been gone to the hospital. Since Brittany's story is unwavering, the police decide that it's time to take another approach. But will this one be more effective than the last? We make mistakes. I make mistakes every day. Okay? There's stuff I, that I do that I wish that I could take back, but I can't. But the most important thing is that you, that we come in here and we correct our mistakes. And we, you know, you understand what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Good people... If you've done something wrong or if, some, or if you know somebody else has, yeah. may not be you. But if we've done something wrong, we come in here and we talk about it. And if you know anything, and let's get it and make it right. There's consequences now for, the, for the mistakes that we make. Mm-hmm. So if something happened, if you know something happened, if you were there, because the story you're telling us is not... It's not even close. We want to come in here and resolve this and get it taken care of the best way we can. We had somebody hurt badly. You're a grown adult. You seem like a good person. Nobody's in here saying you're a bad person, but what we're saying is something bad happened to somebody that you know. And we feel like you know what happened. Still, Brittany sticks to her story. It was clear to detectives after the initial interviews on March 24th and the morning of the 25th that there were big gaps in everyone's timelines. Though those inconsistencies would aid them in their investigation, they needed some hard evidence and statements from others to take that next step toward actually arresting the prime suspects for attempted murder. Thankfully for investigators, there was plenty of evidence at the crime scene. Just off of Ashland Avenue, only two miles from the trailer park, was a gas easement set back in the woods. It was there where the most gruesome part of the crime against Adriana took place. Upon entering the easement, detectives came across tire tracks. When Tina's maroon SUV was taken in, it was found that the tires were a match for the tracks left at the scene of the crime. And that wasn't the only evidence the car provided. Spots of blood were found on the dashboard of the car, smeared across the passenger seat headrest, and speckled throughout the back seat. At the easement where the car pulled off, Signs of a struggle were evident. A crowbar sat in the grass with what appeared to be blood spatter peppered over the cold iron surface. Blood and ash were found to be pooled in various spots in the grass and dirt. Pieces of clothing, burnt to an absolute crisp, were found and identified as Adriana's. Her bra was nearly unrecognizable. White napkins marred by blood were also left at the scene as well as a pair of white shoes. There was something else alongside the weapons and blood that may sound a bit familiar. Strands of a hair weave were strewn across the scene, and they didn't belong to Adriana. You wear a weave? <laughs> My daughter was fit, was doing it today. Is that a weave? It's weave. 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 Yeah. Oh, it looks real. <laughs> Thank you. You do the little braids in it and everything? Does she do all that? Yeah, just my hair right here. Oh, that's your Okay. Yeah, she was just braiding these in, but it hurt. We've been doing it for about three or four days now, and it hurt. Mm hmm. Can somebody grab me some toilet paper so I can blow my nose, please? Absolutely. Yeah, Thank you. That the police returned to the interview room about 30 minutes later. By now, it's around 2 in the morning, less than 12 hours after the 911 call was made, and they have a request that Tina may not even realize the importance of. Tina, do me a favor. Stand up and turn around. Hmm. Oh, 
Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> look, look at this right here. Oh, that's weave in there. That's weave in there. You take that out. Well, I told you that my daughter was. Yeah, yeah. Hair. I didn't realize she was weaving all that in the back. Yeah, so this okay. is all my hair right here. Okay. Okay. That worked. Okay. Yeah, that worked. Yeah. You see, the missing patch of hair on the back of Tina's head was a match for the hair left at the scene of the brutal attack. It's likely that as Adriana bravely fought for her life, she managed to pull out the chunk of Tina's hair. And if the matching hair wasn't damning enough, at the scene of the crime, investigators found perhaps the most critical piece of evidence in the case, a black taser lying in the grass, which brought up an important question. Who owned the taser? As you can imagine, no one from the mobile home park could quite agree on an answer. Though they were eager to throw one another under the bus, their discussion of the taser gives a glimpse of the possible motive behind the gruesome crime and provides a look at how dysfunctional their relationships were leading up to the attack on Adriana. In Tina's first interrogation, mere hours after the attack, investigators ask if she recalls police visiting to speak to Adriana about problems in the trailer park the previous week. You know, the police came out there last week to talk to her about the problems she had in her neighborhood. Yeah, they talked to me too. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you were there. Mm -hmm. What was the problem? Um, her and my, well, oh, another girl come out there to fight Adriana because Adriana was supposed to have gotten smart with her on the phone. Okay. And Adriana's boyfriend was there, Andre Smith. Mm -hmm. And he sent Andre, Adriana in the house. No. He came outside the house, and he was saying that I was in the middle of that, which I didn't even know the white girl. And he said, oh, he cussed all the kids out and me that was outside. And he told Adriana to go in the house and get that thing or whatever. She came back outside on the porch. She was on the porch cussing, and she came out in the walkway, and she tried to tase my daughter. Who tried to tase your daughter? Adriana. Adriana got a taser? Mm -hmm. What kind of taser? Um, I just think it's, it was a black one. A black one. She said that... Um, you seen it? Yeah, everybody well, out there saw it. it. I just know it was black. Okay. And it made a loud noise. Okay. Everybody out there saw it. Heather has a different story about who owned the taser, however, and Tina isn't going to like it. Does Brittany have any problems with the... Uh, Ariana? Uh, Adriana had got Adriana. into it, and Adriana tried to tase her. That's all that Brittany uh, had told me. Adriana, they had got into it, and Adriana tried to tase her. How long ago was this? I think that was like two, two three weeks ago. They had got into it. What kind of taser she got? Who has a taser? Uh, Brittany had a taser. Brittany had a taser. Did the, the taser belong to Brittany? I'm not sure. What did what, what that taser look like? Uh, I seen it once before. It was big. It was long. It was a long taser. Mm -hmm. It was made. What color? Black. Okay. It was black. Mm -hmm. It was probably about that long. It had like little things on the side of it. I never seen the taser before. That was the first time I ever seen it when I seen yeah. it. How you know it's Brittany's? Brittany had it, so I don't know. Have you ever seen Brittany with that taser before this? No. This today was the first time I seen her with. You saw Tina today, today or today? Today was the first time. Today I you saw Tina. Uh, I Brittany. seen Brittany with it on the counter earlier. Today. Earlier today, it was laying on a counter in at her house, and, and in Tina's house. house. And I seen that taser, and I asked her, I said, "What is that taser for?" And they told me to stay out of grown folks' business. Mm -hmm. You can hear the uncertainty in her voice when she says no with an upward inflection. When she repeats her answers, it's clear that she's attempting to make them sound more affirmative and honest, and she's trying to solidify her story. No, this, today was the first time I've seen her with. Today was the first time Today I've you seen. saw Tina? Was, was uh, Tina there? Tina was outside. She didn't hear us say that? No. When you asked her about that? Tina was outside. Tina always telling me to stay out of grown full of business. When the investigators returned to question Tina after speaking with Heather, they had new information to use against her in their quest for answers. We talked to you earlier about the taser. I told you about taser. Uh huh. What did you tell me about that taser? That um, Brittany and the day that um, 
a white girl came over to fight Adriana. Mm -hmm. That um, Dre, uh, Andre told Adriana to go get that thing, and she went in the house and got Taser. Okay. Got the Taser with me. Okay. What about the Taser that was over at your house today? Taser at my house? Mm hmm. I don't know about you don't know about Taser at your house? No, sir. I've been told about Taser at your house. I didn't know it was there. You don't know anything about it, huh? Tina is extremely uncomfortable with this topic of conversation. She repeats back the question, which has the same sort of effect as a pause. It gives her more time to contemplate her answer. She keeps her hands perfectly placed in her lap, which is extremely atypical in normal conversation and indicate she is in a state of cognitive overload as a result of having to think very hard about what she should say. We don't observe these types of responses in individuals who are volunteering information from actual memory, and her odd behavior certainly hasn't gone unnoticed by the investigators. Heather's telling me that she always has to protect Adriana from you and your daughter. Mm -hmm. You and your daughter chasing around all over the place. Your daughter has a taser. She saw the taser over at your house today. My baby don't have a taser. We never had a taser. I don't taser. know. That's what she's telling me. Why is she telling me that? I don't know. We never had a taser, sir. Okay. Adriana had a taser. We never had a taser. My baby was tased. Y'all stories she are getting further taser. and further apart. Like I said, Adriana tried to tase Brittany with the taser. I'm the Brittany has a scratch across her chest right here mm. that I was grabbing Brittany from off the porch so that they wouldn't fight. I told you we were best friends in that trailer park in the beginning. That's funny because Heather says that her and Adriana are best friends and that you and Adriana don't get along and that you and Adriana are constantly having problems and that you and your daughter have been chasing Adriana around this trailer park trying to hurt her and that you have a taser in your house, oh. and that that taser was Brittany's taser, oh and that Brittany had chased is, When the police Adriana come out around. there, if you can check back, when the police come, came out there, Adriana called the police that day. Okay. I told the police what happened. The same thing I'm telling you is that Adriana tried to tase Brittany with the taser. The same thing I'm telling you, Adriana called the police that day. And you want to press charges? No, I, do what I say. I don't know. No, actually, no. They didn't even come out there to press charges. They told us to just cool it out, cool it out for us stay on our side, for her to stay on that side. That's well, what I she talked said. to and the that officer Adriana who came out there that night. Was supposed to be leaving town. She was not going to be here for long. Okay, right. Because I talked to that officer. He told okay. me exactly that. Okay. But he told me that Adriana did not wish to pursue charges against y'all. Well, and he never asked us about pressing charges. He just said for us to cool it out because he's tired of coming out here. He didn't ask you because you weren't the one bringing forth the charges. She was. Okay. Her. Why would I bring charges? I didn't. No, you weren't. I know she I was going to bring charges against y'all for attacking her. But we didn't attack her. But so that's when, what, what she needed. Told. Her boyfriend. Adriana's boyfriend told her to go get that thing. Adriana was standing on the porch arguing. She wasn't even thinking about going to get a taser. He told her to go get that thing. We didn't know what that thing was until she came outside with it. I didn't know she had a taser. Then why is Heather saying that she sees the taser in your house and that Brittany has it? And that Brittany Where is, is trying it? to... I know where it is right now. It's in my evidence locker. Okay, well... Well, then why, why, how do we have it? Because Heather says you have it. Where in the get a taser from? We don't even know nobody here. We don't have no family here. Only people we know is the people in the trailer park. Where would we get a taser from? I don't know. You can buy them all over the place. Hmm? They sell them at pawn shops and everywhere else. As you can see, Tina is growing frustrated with Heather throwing her daughter under the bus. Brittany, however, seems a lot less upset about it. We have information that that you and uh, uh, Andrea, you know, uh, that y'all argued a lot. Mm -hmm. And y'all fought. Uh, mm -hmm. Your mom had to break you up one time. Is this true? Yeah. What was y'all fighting about? I have the slightest idea. <laughs> if you really want to know the truth, somebody else was there to fight her. We were outside to watch. She gets mad and she tries to tase me. We have Heather saying that that the taser belonged to you. Mm -hmm. 
she seen it at your house. Okay. Is, is, this, is this the truth or a lie? It's a lie. Only time I've seen the taser was when Adriana tried to tase me that night, Mom. Well, that day, Mom had to separate us. And how long ago was that? Um, two weeks ago. Something like that. Is that when you almost had to fight on the porch? Yeah. You ever seen a stun gun over in uh, anybody's house? Oh, yeah. Where you seen one at? At um, Zimmerman's house. Okay. That's interesting you say that because your wife says she saw it over at Tina's house. Uh, so your wife's telling us all this stuff that makes Tina look bad. Uh-huh. And you're telling us that it was at Zimmerman's house, right? It was gave to her. It was gave to her by who? Um, Andre Smith. Andre Smith gave her a taser. Yeah. Where's Andre Smith? He locked up. He locked. Is that her boyfriend or her husband? Her boyfriend. Boyfriend. And describe it. Well, actually, I already described it, didn't I? Can't I really ask you to describe. Well, you got tape on because the back part missed. Okay. Who That's put the, the tape on? Table. And who, who put the tape on? Who put the tape on? Mm-hmm. I don't know who put the tape on. You mentioned some tape. Because there's tape on there. I don't okay. like tape. All right. But you saw it with tape on there because the back's missing. So, mm-hmm. I mean, you seeing a taser and there's tape on it is one thing. You seeing a taser and knowing the reason for the tape being on it is a totally different thing. Exactly. So how come you know that the back is missing? Was this explained to you, or did you see it put on, or do you know? No, I seen the tape. Okay. But like I said, seeing tape, if you saw tape on this recorder Uh on here, you wouldn't necessarily know that the tape's on there to keep the battery in place. If you ain't got no back part, I know. Doesn't have no back part. Okay. So it has no back plate and tape's on it. Yeah. Okay. That does make sense. All right. So... Andre Smith gave it to her. Yeah. Where does she normally keep it? In a cabinet. A- where? In the top cabinet. By the refrigerator. And who else would know this? Who else be in the house? Why, she go, hey, here's where I keep my taser? No, because she was like always pulling it out and be playing with it. Really? Well, she made threats with people or something? No, she just been playing. You know? Now, I ain't gonna lie. At one point in time, everybody was cool with everybody. Strangely enough, Darren's story aligns more closely with Tina's than with his own wife's. It's possible that Heather is trying to frame Tina while Darren is telling the truth so he doesn't get himself into trouble. The taser incident between Adriana and Brittany is just one domino falling in the long line of conflict that led to the attack of Adriana, a compounding of incidents that will unravel, revealing an absurd motive. Following the first round of interrogations, everyone was released and sent home unaware of just how much evidence was rapidly stacking up against them. And though they weren't talking freely to police, they sure were talking to people in their lives, people they probably shouldn't have been trusting. On April 7, 2010, officers received a call from one of Tina's relatives in Illinois. They refused to identify themselves and stated that they had information to disclose about the case. According to the source, Tina called her mother two days after the attack, and admitted that she, Brittany, and Heather beat Adriana. She managed to scramble away, which caused a heated argument between Tina and Brittany. Brittany tackled Adriana as she made one last attempt to escape into the woods, and it was then that Tina lit her on fire. Tina, Heather, and Brittany callously fled. Though Brittany realized she left her shoes at the scene of the crime as they drove away, Tina told her it was too late to turn around. Afterward, Tina ordered Brittany to leave the area and stay away until the police were gone. Brittany took that time to take care of some evidence, washing the car interior with hand sanitizer, burning the clothes they were wearing, and disposing of the lighter fluid. While telling her relatives the story, Tina didn't appear to have much remorse whatsoever for her actions. When her relatives urged her to turn herself in so the law would potentially go easy on Brittany, Tina told them that even if Adriana died, They'd be fine because the cops had no real evidence against them. But on the late night of April 8th, only one day after that call was made to the police, Adriana tragically passed away. Her family by her side, 
having never woken from the coma she fell into. She died just five days before her 20th birthday and never had the opportunity to turn her life around. The attempted murder that police were almost certain Tina, Brittany, and Heather had committed had turned into a homicide. On the same day that Adriana passed, even more evidence against the three women was brought to light. Police received a call from a high school classmate of Brittany's named Regine, stating that she had been being harassed by Brittany and Tina regarding the case. When police reported to the high school, Regine stated she had received multiple calls from both Brittany and Tina, trying to convince her to pose as Brittany during a polygraph test so that Brittany could pass. The police were almost certain they were the culprits, but the question of why they committed these terrible crimes in the first place remained to be answered. To get to the bottom of it, both Brittany and Tina were interviewed immediately after their arrests. Tina, you remember me? And this is the Tyree. Mm -hmm. you, know what, you know what this is all about. However, instead of starting with questions, they begin by giving her some information. Now we're going to tell you what, what we think happened. Good, Tom. On that particular night, you, Brittany, and Heather were gotten in a, in a verbal altercation, a physical altercation with Adriana Zimmerman. Okay. Okay. The fight kind of escalated a little bit, got out of hand. She was attacked with a, a tire, a pry, pry bar, whatever you want to call it, crowbar. Uh -huh. And uh, then she was disabled with a stun gun and then set on fire. And all this was supposed to happen in the trailer park and nobody heard it. Not at the trailer. I didn't say at the trailer park. I'm saying during this that night. It originated at the trailer park. You, Brianna, uh, Brittany, Heather, and maybe one or two other people transported her over to the Ashland Avenue on the gas lines, and that's where the... The what? What? Ashland Avenue. What is that? It's out another road over by the house. And that's where it went bad. We've got information that you're, you're involved in. It's true they do, in fact, have some groundbreaking information. You see, there's a very specific reason that Tina was sought out by investigators. And when they finally divulge it, she's going to be absolutely shocked. Like this, Tina. This Not only did our victim name you, you know first what? and last name. We went and talked to those not people only yesterday. did they name Heather. Not only did they name your daughter. You've also told people. You know, that's how we know the story, too. Me? Yeah. Why don't you let me finish telling? Okay. Okay? Go ahead. We hear that you used lighter fluid, poured it on her and lit her up. And you're mad at Brittany because she got up off the girl, and that's how she got up and got to run away. I'm mad at my baby. Mm -hmm. Okay. What else, sir? Yeah. What else? What else is it? She told two people. Who? She told the fire chief, and she told the EMS supervisor. Okay. Now, when okay. did she do that? Right before. Right before. They put her under. I got to talking to her, and I told her that I was probably going to be the last person she talked to for a while, and that we, in order to catch the people that did this to her, I needed her to tell me if she knew who it was. She told me yes, and she named three girls. Um... A Tina, a Heather, and a Brittany. She did not give me last names. Um, and I asked her why they did it to her, and she said, um, I thought we'd made up. If Adriana's supposed to have told these people this, wouldn't you think that she would have told them everything that can happen if you land on the ground and you burn up and you're about to die? She told everything she could was the pain she was in at that time, and they didn't give her long because they had to put her out. She said, you know, EMS supervisor told her, she kept asking, her, am I going to make it? Am I going to make it? Am I going to make it? She said, I'm going to do the best we can for you. The detectives have become privy to some other damning information that they share with Tina, and it's all about to come crashing down on her. Hey, you ain't going around here telling people yeah. you killed that girl. You're talking to your relatives and telling them that, and they're calling us. But you're talking to somebody and telling them that, uh, well, if you go ahead and die, Y'all be good to go. Well, that ain't the case, is it? Because she died. She died last night. She comes to her wounds. <laughs> they told us that she was in a coma yesterday. <laughs> she died last night. She died last night. 
Why you think we come back out there like gangbusters today? Mm -hmm. That's why you're under arrest for murder. He's dead. The one who told us that. Who? Um, our lawyer, Gene, is dead. He said he called down there and he said that she was in a deep a coma. Well, she didn't come out of it. But guess what? We got information from the ME that she didn't make it because of the burns. Now, you sit there, you think about it. You think, you think about what we're saying. That woman, those kids would never see their mama again. You've got a chance to see your kids. I think I don't know that. You've got a chance to see your kids again somewhere down the road. Now, like I said, I'm not going to sit, we're not going to sit here as, with you as long as we did last, the other night. Maybe you didn't mean for it to be this way, but that's what I said. We don't know. So you're going to need, you need us to be able to tell your side of the story when it comes time to go before the judge. And by you just sitting over there, not, you know, thinking we don't have nothing, we've only gave you a little bit of what we got. And believe me, it's not all, it's not hearsay. We know, we know that that night, those clothes were taken and burned that y'all were wearing. Burned where? Uh, that, I'm, we you still know. had the same clothes yeah. on the next morning when they came to get us. Don't you have two small children? You know these children? She went country. Yes, I know them. Okay. It's her mama they ain't never going to see again. Yeah, that oldest little, that, I think the oldest one was a boy, correct? He saw yeah. this. He saw he saw, he saw the stuff going down at the at the at the trailer park that night. No, that, that when those people said that those babies was locked up in the room. I'm saying the people <laughs> they saw all the commotion with us at their all's house that night. They were sitting in oh, yeah. that patrol car. They knew something was wrong. Have you ever heard of a dying declaration? No. That's powerful. I'm gonna tell you now. When we walk out this door this afternoon, there's not go next time you see me, we'll be we'll be, a, we'll be in a court. Either way it go. I ain't going home, so right. But then I, I don't wanna walk out this I door. I wanna talk, but I'm not saying that's what I wanna tell you. <laughs> I can't hear what you said. Did you what did you say? You, you usually when I'm talking to somebody about a murder that's happened, and I'm giving them that advice that I think they should talk to me because I realize it's probably one of the last things you want to talk to a person about, it, and and certainly you don't want to tell the cops about it. But I think the thing that keep in mind and what and I what I reiterate to these people, and uh, is that you know if there's circumstances. If there's a if there's a reasoning behind this that could be mitigating, I mean, if there's a reason why this happened, that you know shows why you did this, it had to be agonizing, and then to run a distance that she ran because we know, I mean, the, the burnt clothes and and her shoes and everything is right there in the in the woods to run that distance to a house and beg for help and to wait there still cooking. For the ambulance to get there. And then the last thing you're saying is, besides telling who your accusers are, am I going to see my kids? Am I going to live? Those are your last questions before you're knocked out and told, hey, you may or may not talk to somebody again. In one last ditch effort to get a confession or some semblance of remorse from Tina, a detective presents her with a photo of Adriana's charred body. Just let me, let me tell you something. That's her body. Oh hey, let me let me look at. I want you to look at him so you, I know you you understand what I'm saying. The medical staff and the medical examiner's office didn't even know if this girl was white or black, or black female or white female, because she was so burnt so bad. They didn't have a copy of our report at the time. I just want, I just, you, you wouldn't want this happening, you would you? You wouldn't want, you wouldn't want, 
You wouldn't want to go out this way, would you? Huh? Okay, we're gonna transfer. We're gonna transport this across the street. This hand's not right there right now. Okay. Tina doesn't budge. However, the photos have clearly had an effect on her. After she's left in the room waiting to be taken to jail, she mumbles haunting things to herself through her sobs, even seemingly calling out to Adriana. The words she chooses to use are bone-chilling. Adriana, Lord, have mercy. Come back and haunt, haunt, terrorize. Please, Adriana. Adriana. I told you. I told you. Oh, you little sweet girl. Oh, I tried to avoid. <laughs> The question of why they committed these terrible crimes in the first place remained to be answered. As it turns out, there were numerous alleged love triangles within the trailer park. All of the dirty truth, it seems, began making its way to the surface. Not only did Adriana reportedly tell Heather that Tina was sleeping with Darren, but allegedly Adriana herself was sleeping with Darren. And Heather had confronted her about it. It's a messy web of cheating and lies one that Darren is surprisingly transparent about. However, he leaves out something that came out during the trial. According to Tina, she only slept with Darren in exchange for substances. Tell me what was going on. There's been a discussion between us about an accusation flying around between you uh, being accused of sleeping with uh, your neighbor and friend of your wife. Is that correct? Yeah. What's her name? Tim Brown. Tina Brown, okay. So the accusation is that you've been sleeping with Tina Brown, and who has been making these accusations? Everybody. Everybody. Yeah. Has Andrina Zimmerman been making those accusations? Yeah, my, yes, my, my wife told me that. She told me that today. Okay, so your wife told you that Andriana had reported to her that you've been sleeping with Tina Brown. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. Okay. If you recall, in Darren's video interrogation with police, he dilly-dallied on the phone while he was unashamedly talking and laughing with someone, someone who wasn't his wife. I will call you right back, man. Uh, you done? Yeah. All right. Is that Heather? Lieutenant Ronan. Huh? I'm on the Lieutenant Ronan, man. Oh, sorry. When you said you were on the phone with your sugar thing or whatever just now, was it Tina you were talking to? No, it's not that girl. Okay. Um, but you told me that night you were seeing Tina. Yeah. Okay. So is she not your sugar thing? Yeah, that's my old mom. Okay. That's old mom. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, did you and Ms. Zimmerman have any kind of relationship? Somewhere. All right. Did y'all have? Somewhere. Okay. Well, this ain't like Monica Lewinsky, man. We, we, we you know, yeah, uh, yeah, did yeah. you have sex with her or did you? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you had sexual intercourse with Ms. Zimmerman. Yeah. Did your wife know of this? No. Did your wife know of you having sex with Tina? No. I bet she don't know about this other thing you got on the side <laughs> of this. Okay. Um, okay. So, um, have you been accused by Heather of having sex with Zimmerman? Uh-uh. Okay. All of Tina. Did Tina make any accusations? I mean, Tina probably knows that you're sleeping with Zimmerman, doesn't she? Okay, so none of you girls know who, that you're sleeping with the other one. Mm-hmm. You're doing a good game, right? Okay. So, Heather is aware of the accusations of you having sex with Tina. Tina. Yeah. But her and Tina are still tight cooking fish together. See, that's what blows my mind, man. You got a good game going on. If them two, knowing... The accusation there, you still got them over there cooking fish together. Mm-hmm. Either you got a good game or Tina does because she's playing it off well. <laughs> so, um, you know, me and Rusty sat there and laughed about that all night, but we couldn't figure out how you were getting away with that, man, because our wives would, you know, yeah. we'd be done. <laughs> they, they'd have our cars and our boats and everything else, <laughs> you know. So you getting away with it. 
On May 10th, soon after Tina, Heather, and Brittany were arrested, the police received a letter from an incarcerated man who said he knew who killed Adriana and what the true motive was for the heinous crime. He stated that several months prior to the murder, he bought an illegal substance from Darren at the Roadway Inn. He alleged that Adriana was with Darren in the hotel room while the illegal transaction took place. According to him, Heather arrived and threatened Adriana with a box cutter, reportedly yelling that she would get Adriana sooner or later. Fortunately, their day in court came sooner rather than later. During the trial, it was revealed that the murder was even more disturbing than police could have imagined. Adriana had been lured to the trailer by Tina under the guise of rekindling their friendship. When she arrived, Tina used the stun gun on her and dragged her to the bedroom. There, Heather stuffed a sock in her mouth, and Brittany beat her. When they drove her to the woods, Brittany and Tina took turns tasing her until Tina poured gasoline on her and lit her on fire. According to Heather, as the fire started, Tina jumped up and down, exclaiming, Burn, bitch, burn. Tina Brown received a death sentence for her crimes against her former friend, making her one of only three women on Florida's death row. Though Brittany was 16 at the time of the murder, she was sentenced to life in prison. Heather took a plea bargain, testifying against Tina in order to receive only 25 years for the second-degree murder she was convicted of. At the time of this video, Tina has filed a motion to have her death sentence thrown out because of false testimony at her trial. According to Tina and a witness at the trial, the witness was coerced by Heather to testify that Tina had confessed to her in jail that she was the mastermind behind Adriana's murder. Heather reportedly threatened the witness, forcing her to say that Heather was present but had nothing to do with the murder. To this day, the former friends are spinning rumors about each other and trying to climb over one another to reach salvation. Only time will tell what the law will decide. But one thing is for certain, this brutal yet petty crime against Adriana should never have happened.